Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah? Awesome. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me in Berlin. I just got here yesterday, so I'm a little jet lagged, but I'm here. <laughs> uh, you can follow me at Twitter, at Gina. And as he mentioned, I'm a senior product designer at Salesforce. Um, I'm also the design lead for Team SaaS Design. Uh, we rebranded and redesigned the SaaS website. I'm going to start with one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's, it used to be that designers made an object and walked away. Today, the emphasis must shift to designing the entire life cycle, and that's by Paul Sappho. Um, you know, throughout the, the years, I think, in web design, people have moved away from creating just pages and more towards creating systems. Um, and so that's um, a lot of what my work is involved with is creating design systems. Um, I'm actually on the design team at Salesforce called Systems, and we uh, work on the style guide, uh, you know, maintain like all the patterns and try to have consistency, because it's a really big company. I'll go into that a little bit more uh, in a bit. <clears throat> Another one of my favorite quotes is by Nate Fortin, which says, a fractured process makes for a fractured user experience. Uh, whether you're working on design, development, copywriting, product management, you know, whatever your role is, we're all working towards a user experience in the end. And so it's really important to have a really solid uh, process in place. So right now, style guides are like all the rage. Um, pretty much every conference has style guide talks now. I'll, so thanks for letting me talk about them. <laughs> um, they've also come a really long way. Um, back in 2004, during my internship at Odin Marketing Design, this was my first time ever actually working on a style guide. And this was a PDF style guide. And it basically covered the brand guidelines, uh, documented the CSS that I was writing, um, and like the different layouts and grids. And I learned very quickly that PDFs suck uh, to maintain uh, for style guides. Fast forward to about 2007, uh, I was working at Apple in the Apple online store. And I started working on a style guide, and I wanted to do it online, because I really did not want to do it um, on a, you know, in a PDF. Um, I chose WordPress, which at the time I thought was really smart. Um, <laughs> uh, I, also, I was so excited about doing these online style guides. Uh, I wrote this article um, for List Apart called Writing an Interface Style Guide. And the TLDR of that article is um, design, you know, document your design and brand standards, your front-end development standards, and to keep your style guides current and useful. Current and useful is the really key part here. And I realized that WordPress was only slightly easier than maintaining the PDF, and nobody would update it except me. And so it became pretty useless, and it got discarded, unfortunately. Uh, 2010, I was working at Engine Yard, and uh, it was my first time having to learn SAS. They said, if you're going to write code, you're going to write SAS, because we write SAS. Um, I was really uh, hesitant at first, because I thought I didn't need SAS, and then I learned it wasn't that I needed it, that I wanted to use SAS. Um, it very quickly became uh, natural for me, and I can't imagine writing CSS without it. It was also my first time trying a living style guide, which is when you, know, you put your style guide inside the application um, itself. Um, this is what it looked like really early in 2011. Since then, it's evolved, and um, since I've left, the designers have kept it going, which I'm really happy to see. Um, but the thing that uh, I realized when I was working on this was um, this was awesome. SAS and style guides are super awesome together. Um, <clears throat> I wrote about my process of uh, refactoring the CSS and uh, doing a living style guide on their, um, their blog at Engine Yard, so if you're interested, you can read that later. It's, um, in my, my current workflow, very outdated, but I think it still um, holds up in terms of like, what that pr process was like for me and uh, the way I went, ap uh, went about it back then. The th big thing I learned is that you have to make documentation a regular part of your workflow and not something that you hold off until the end, because you're never really going to do it if that's the way you approach it. Um, 
the other thing I learned was you don't want to document everything at once because you'll likely give up. I've done it many, many times. I think I'm going to try to take everything all in one go, and uh, then it ends up becoming this monolithic branch and never gets merged, and then it was just a big waste of time. Instead, you want to document going forward as you approach things. If you're making something new in your application, that's the time to document it. If you're revising something, like refactoring, uh, you know, refactor it and then document it. Um, when I was working at Do, uh, we did a living style guide similar to what uh, I mentioned before. Um, but then we also were working on the iOS and Android app, which does not live in the HTML and CSS code base, because we were doing native. Um, whoa, my next slide got messed up. Sorry. Um, this is... Sorry, ignore that. <laughs> that was supposed to be a screenshot of the style guide. I'll, I'll replace it when I upload my sli uh, slides later. Um, but the thing we did in that style guide is uh, we... Um, documented our elements and then at the basic level and then branching those out into components and then into layouts. And we also wanted to show each object, um, every type of that object, um, all the states of that object and the variations. A really good example of this is the uh, Android style guide. They'll show like all the different like focus states, press states, disabled, all that. Um, and we also did a responsive sandbox uh, which is basically a bunch of iframes that we could work against. And we used a URL string, and we could just change that out, and all the iframes would change. And it was really handy for getting a kind of a general idea of what things would look like. Of course, it's not an exact representation of what's going to be on your phone or your tablet, but it kind of gives you an idea. Um, during this process, I learned that the visual changes that we would approach for native mobile were a nightmare, because um, the way I was d handling it back then was I would design it in Photoshop, uh, save out all my screens and assets in Dropbox, and then post it up on a GitHub wiki for that uh, project repository. And that led to really sad times for me, <laughs> because every single change was just like that entire workflow process over and over again. I'll come back to how uh, we're doing that now um, at Salesforce in a minute. Um, in 2013, uh, we launched the SaaS website, which I'm re still really excited about. And because I was writing um, the code for an open sourced website, um, you know, there were a lot of things to consider in this process. Um, here's what the site looks like, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, the style guide is live, so you can see it, and it lives on the website. And similarly to how I mentioned before, uh, we used some of the same tools. It turns, so when we did the responsive uh, sandbox at Do, we actually hand-built it. But it turns out um, you can actually uh, use an open source version that was built by Matt Kersley that does all that for you. Um, so I recommend doing that. So when you open source a website, that means anybody can contribute. And that, you know, I wanted to leave it up to like, where if you wanted to design something, you could do that too. And so I was concerned about, like, what happens if a color gets added? The style guide needs to be updated, too. And so I started thinking about, like, how to keep things maintainable and in uh, one central source. And so I was looking at, like, how can a style guide and the SAS share, like, the same source uh, so that you don't have to write the variable and then write the HTML to display the swatch that would output that variable? I'm sure we're all familiar with the phrase, don't repeat yourself. Um, so my approach that I did back then, um, you know, this was before SAS maps and all that stuff came out in SAS. Um, the site was built on Middleman, which is a static site generator uh, done on Ruby. So you can use like, you know, Haml, SAS, Markdown, um, you know, all sorts of neat stuff that would normally come in a Ruby and Rails app, but it's just, you know, a simple static site generator. Um, because I was using middleman, um, I was able to, in the, there's a data folder where you can dump in like JSON or YAML files. Um, and a less known fact about uh, SAS in Ruby is you can actually change the extension to .erb at the end of the 
SCSS, and it'll still compile as SAS, but now you can pass Ruby into it as well. And so I stored uh, my names and my colors in my YAML file, and then in my CSS, I actually generated the variables needed with the values, and then in the markup, generated all the swatches that would display those. And so we only had one central place to store the colors. And so every time a new color gets added, a new swatch just appears in the style guide. Um, I thought this was pretty cool, and I was really proud of it. And I showed it to Chris Epstein, and he was like, oh, we don't really want you generating your variables like that. And I was like, well, give me a way to do this better. <laughs> um, but I still felt pretty proud of it, and it's, it's still... Um, it works like this on the SAS site now, but I'm planning to go back and refactor it to you know, try to use SAS maps, which have come out, um, and see if I can do something a little more sassy than uh, doing things in the Ruby and YAML and JSON and whatnot. <laughs> okay. So, now I work at Salesforce. Uh, do, the company I mentioned before, Do, was actually part of Salesforce, um, and it got sunsetted, and then I moved over to the Salesforce design team. And uh, we're working on uh, what we're calling a living design system. So, I'm, as I mentioned before, style guides have to remain current and useful. The moment they stop being current, they're no longer useful, um, and then they'll get discarded. So a lot of people have been working on tools like automated style guides that will read through your CSS. If you use Markdown in your comments, they'll dis <clears throat> display the documentation in the order that your SAS compiles and um, you know, show like, what the component would look like, give a description, um, which is pretty similar. Uh, this, is, this example here is StyleDoco. There's also KSS. There's a whole bunch of them out there now. Um, our style guide at Salesforce is pretty similar to this doco style. So we write our markup in our SAS um, as a comment, and it'll display in a style guide. But we actually take it further and generate our components from that as well. You can check out our style guide at this app, uh, uh, this URL. The style guide is actually what made me want to join my team, because I really thought the style guide was beautiful, and I wanted to work on it. So now I do. <laughs> Um, but the thing I've learned at Salesforce is design for enterprise has challenges, really big challenges. Um, we have our responsive prototypes that we work on internally, and then separate from that, we have our responsive production framework, which is an internal um, framework called Aura that uh, Salesforce has developed. Uh, we also you know, are looking at iOS watch, phone, tablet, Android watch, phone, tablet, Windows phone, and then we have all our acquisitions and partners that want to build within our UI framework as well. It's a lot to think about. <laughs> and so um, the big question is, how do we keep colors, spacing, sizes, et cetera, consistent across all these things? Um, how do we make the future design changes easier across all these platforms and all these things? Um, and mind you, all those things I mentioned, um, we have many, many products too, so like, that's like a whole other layer on top of all this. And because a lot of different teams or different products might be using different platforms or different frameworks, how do we keep our design system agnostic? Um, you know, one team might use SAS, one might use less, one might be working natively in uh, Android. Um, so how do we like, work within all these different things? Um, there's you know, the phrase, single source of truth. That's a phrase that we throw around a lot internally. Um, how do we find the single source of truth? So when I started, I presented um, you know, what I did for the SAS website and ask, is there a way we can kind of do something sort of like this, but uh, not done in Ruby, done in, you know, um, we, we use Node, and so can we do this in Node instead, and can we make it expand all these different things? And the engineer I work with, Sanke, actually built it that day, and I was so impressed, and I love working with him, he's so smart. So uh, we open source an NPM module called Theo, and it's basically a theme, we call it a token generator. Um, Theo is essentially um, 
an NPM module that lets you write all your design in uh, JSON, so like name and value pairs, like colors with their values, uh, font sizes, uh, font faces, like, like whatever um, is an like attribute. Um, and it'll then generate SAS, it'll generate less, it'll generate stylus, generates Aura, uh, generates JSON for iPhone. It was doing PLIS, but it's been moved to iPhone, uh, JSON now, and XML for Android. And so some examples of that would look like, like we would um, write it like this uh, in the JSON file, and then it would generate the SAS file necessary. And then all the different teams can consume it you know, whether they're using less, stylus, or uh, And then, of course, the HTML used for the style guide consumes that as well. Um, on top of that, it also tries to be smart about the way these different platforms uh, take things. So, for example, color, um, we might do hex for CSS, RGBA for iOS, or eight-digit hex for Android. So it does that conversion process. Um, values uh, and for sizing can be different. So with CSS, you might do pixels, rams, or m's. For iOS, you might do points. For Android, you might do SP or DIP. Um, so it tries to do the calculation for that as well. And then every time the various teams build their apps, they pull in the design values uh, via get and npm. And then everything's consistent. There's no more hard-coded values. There's no more asking like five or six different teams, hey, can you bump that font size up two more pixels? Um, and you know, there's, um, it's a lot easier because we do the work, and then when, next time they pull it down, they have it. We also have our assets stored in a repository as SVGs, um, like a GitHub repository. And we have another NPM module that we open source called Blender, which rasterizes the SVGs as a fallback. And then our style guide actually will just hook into the GitHub repo and display all the assets automatically. And so we don't have to update that manually as well. Uh, as well. And so a change in one place changes everywhere. And we get uh, true consistency. <clears throat> um, so Sanka, the engineer I was working with, um, he, like, he likes to coin things, and so he coined it the living, uh, actually, I have that wrong, it's not style system, it's living design system. And um, one of the really great things about this is um, one of the engineers that I've been working with that's uh, working on the Aura uh, CSS framework told me that it's the first time he's felt that UX and engineering has been like really, truly collaborating together. Um, so that's really exciting, and I'm really excited to see how uh, much farther we can take this forward. And if you're interested in reading more about it, we just uh, posted a Medium article about it. Uh, Sanka wrote it. It's called Living Design System. And you know the slides will be available later, and so you can get all the links. Um, and so you can find, he, he writes into a little bit more depth of how we do this. Um, be regular and orderly in your life so they may be violent and original in your work. It's one of my favorite quotes by Gustav Flaubert. Um, and I like to think about that every time I'm like, working on frameworks or um, you know, anytime I'm doing like, a new project or if I'm revising uh, past projects. Um, so we're really excited about this and we're hoping to kind of like see how other people use it. And so if you're interested, um, you know, Feel free to tinker with them, uh, submit a pull request, or ask me questions. Um, I also want to see other companies, um, how they do it. I'm sure there's a lot of different like, enterprise companies, or even like, smaller companies, that maybe have a similar problem, but are approaching this in different ways. I would love to hear about that, because um, I think it's awesome that all these tools are being generated, and the more you put out there, like, it's only going to make the community better and make us all better. Um, so please like, share with me and uh, you know, like what you're doing as well. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Salesforce UX, and our dribble is Salesforce. If you're interested in more about Team SaaS Design and what we're doing there, you can follow us at Team SaaS Design, uh, as well as on Dribble. I also host a local uh, SaaS meetup in San Francisco called The Mixin. If you're ever in San Francisco and you want to give a talk, uh, let me know, and we can plan a whole meetup around you coming. Um, we don't always just have SaaS speakers. Like it's just 
uh, front end focused. Um, I'm also um, super excited about Suzy, which is a responsive layout system that is agnostic to markup. It does the math for you, but you can have the classes or, or you know, markup that you want. It tries to stay out of that, which is really awesome. And you can follow me at Twitter, Dribble, Instagram, and GitHub at Gina. Thanks.